intentionally doing something or you're aware of your surroundings or your breathing if we are gathering whether it's the materials to make basketry or um, you know kind of a contemporary mix with like the fancy beads and then traditional abalone and pine nuts um, I don't know if you've ever seen bull pine trees um, they're like the big pine cones that look like um, pineapples mm -hmm. these come out of those um, we are not thinking negative thoughts when we're gathering. It's intentionally positive. And we're not saying words that are hurtful or gossipy. We're not swearing. And so if you're in a bad mood or in a foul mood, you just don't even touch the stuff because it's all about the energy that you're bringing into the space. And so you don't want to like, contaminate the material. And we view these as living beings because this is all organic material. And so this is viewed as a as um, medicine, as protecting us. Just touching it makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. I every hoopa woman should have at least one of these, and we wear them for ceremony and special occasions. And if I'm having um, any kind of day, I just want to feel better. I will put it on my head in my in my house while my cat's on my lap, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because I need to feel connected to home because I'm so far away. And even though I'm on Miwa clan up there, right? And you'll put Miwa clan down here, it helps connect me to a space that I need to be. And um, so when I was trying to write my dissertation and struggling, I was wearing my cap, <laughs> um, visualizing being done. Um, and so we actually have reclamation efforts because auction houses have these. You too could buy one for a thousand dollars. So native people will coordinate on Facebook we share when we see one of these go on sale, even if it's damaged or broken for $200, $400, $500, we save up. Maybe this is why I'm not out of my student loans yet. Um, <laughs> because we try to coordinate who's gonna get, who's gonna um, bid on certain items so that if one person's bidding, then another person won't bid on that. They'll bid on something else because we wanna bring our items home just to any tribal member because we know it's like bringing your relatives home. That's how we view them, or our regalia items. You'll find them in thrift shops, antique stores, any kind of basket materials. When there's a fire, we pack these up like they're a pet or a loved one that we care about, more so than we do our clothes, because these are not replaceable, right? They're not. 
And so I don't know the history of this one, right? But there are weavers I'm trying to weave. Um, <laughs> it's a very hard process. And to have something as fine as this, it takes years and years and years of practice. And so that's a little bit about the basket cap. The knowledge that it requires to do that is called, the academic world calls it traditional ecological knowledge. Mm -hmm. Scientists like to validate what Native people have known since time immemorial, <laughs> and then it's valid. <laughs> and so that's also why I don't use PowerPoint sometimes, <laughs> right? Um, but it's really important. Um, you know, we know cultural burning practices, right? Before, uh, like when California was, um, we were having first contact, there is, there's actually documentation of California being on fire because there were traditional cultural burning practices on a regular basis. Um, getting all the boa fuels, like fire fuel management, you could take a class on that at Columbia College. But you could also go talk to some local native people who knew those practices, right? Um, but then our systems of government had certain controls of fire. And so I have articles on that if you ever want to learn more. But um, so that we are trying to reinsert traditional ways and indigenous ways of knowing in different systems. So in certain spaces like Yosemite, um, you'll see that there's seats at the table for the local neighboring tribes. So that there can be talks about how can we have room for traditional gathering of acorns and materials for basketry. Um, and you know any kind of like traditional burning practices if it's like possible. Um, there's conversations, but when you're dealing with the United States, um, like all the different systems that come into play, right? Forest Service, some uh, county agency, law enforcement gets really complicated. And so every county and every tribe and every space is a little bit different based on that kind of cooperation and respect about the native people of those lands. Um, there's a perception if a tribe has a casino that everything's good because money's supposed to fix everything. Mm -hmm. um, my tribe has a casino. It's probably like, it's definitely smaller than this church. It's probably from like here to where the cookies were. <laughs> um, the Lucky Bear Casino, it's, it's not profitable. Um, people don't come to my reservation to go gamble on there. Um, and so there's a lot of misperceptions about if a tribe has a casino and what that means for that community. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there, just a, a few little tidbits. One thing I, I wanted to share with you, um, there's three things, and these are kind of three different statistics or like education pieces, um, and then we can have um, a little bit further expanding on these, okay? So, One of the, is the current issues is related to this piece about history. Did you know that in the night between a period of 1973 to 1976, um, think about where you were in, those, in the 70s, right? There was an uh, investigation by the United States General Assembly Office. They studied just for that, sh that small snapshot in time, four out of the 12 Indian Health Services regions in the United States had sterilized 3,406 Native American women and girls without their permission. I'm going to say that again. In the period between 70, 1973 and 1976, the Indian Health Services, right, that office, that clinic that's put on reservations or rancherias, four out of the 12 regions of those spaces had forcibly sterilized Native American women and children, Native American women and children, I'll tell you the, the number, 3,406. This is medical professionals. An auntie would go in for her tonsils and come out not being able to be a life giver anymore. They would be coerced and said, if you don't do this, we will take your government, your benefits away. We will take your kids away. Or we know what's best for you. That is an A only from 1973 to 1976. 
and the U.S. government announced these results in 1976. This is what they, the one investigation that they did and released. So forced sterilization and coerced sterilization may be news to you, but it was not news to Native women or Native families. So much so that Native people still to this day do not want to access medical services, especially Indian Health Services. <coughs> On my reservation, we are an hour from Eureka, right? And that's where like the main hospital is. And we have an Indian Health Services clinic in our place. People refuse to go. Some will go. They might get great care. They might have a great doctor. Others may have a terrible experience and terrible doctors because there's a constant cycle of the doctors that come through. We have malpractice suits that occur. And so, like, I got a dog bite. I got bit by two res dogs. One time I took um, supplies up to my mom who still lives up there and she doesn't have um, facilities in the, the place that she lives. And so I brought her a lot of stuff because it was in COVID and I get out of, I turn back to go to my car and get more stuff. And I got bit by two different dogs, right? On my thigh and my cat. Blood is squirting everywhere. I'm like, oh gosh. <laughs> I thought it was me, not my daughter. Um, so I like squirted um, hand sanitizer because we all oh. carried it at that point with yeah. our masks, right? I was like, well, I guess we have to drive an hour to the ER because I'm not going to the Indian Health Services, <laughs> right? I would rather deal with waiting in the ER that also has a terrible reputation. Um, and then guess what happened when I was in the ER? They found out I was from Hoopa and gave me a whole lecture about how they couldn't believe I was educated and had a doctor's degree. <laughs> Instead of like, while they're like supposedly addressing my wounds, right? Like, anyway, so, and I have light skin. That is, how much harder is it for my relatives who have darker skin than me, right? So um, the medical access, we wonder, oh, these guys have all these issues and you could list and you hear diabetes, heart issues, all these other things. Um, we are, we have um, tribal en entities and tribally run health agencies where there's more of an active voice for native people. There's rural Indian health boards, there's um, marketing and um, like in Tuolumne, where my husband's tribe is, there's um, the Tuolumne Band of Miwok Indian people have a governing body that oversees their Indian health services. So if there's anyone can complain about the staff or the doctors, if there's any misjustice, injustice going on, there'll be an immediate review. And so like, I go to that Indian health service. I never thought I'd go to one. <laughs> but I, I go to that one because it's trustworthy, right? Because they have it set up where they have to answer to this governing board. Uh, that's much different than some of these other places, right? And so there's now this bigger influence of Native um, tribal nations and Native people having voices in systems, but we still have major people who, who have dental needs, who have teeth, all of our teeth removed. Mm -hmm. I have a permanent retainer in my mouth, and that practice was outdated 30 years ago, mm -hmm. right? But I was on a reservation, and I was a little girl, and they're on, receiving Medi-Cal and tribal benefits, so they just put in something that didn't even fit my mouth, mm -hmm. right? But it's cemented in my mouth, mm -hmm. right? So quality of care, the populations where we are 1% of the population, so people think we are not significant. In research, the research world, that's not statistically significant mm -hmm. to be included at the table. In fact, it's so much happened that there's actually a research phenomenon called the asterisk phenomenon, where there's not enough data to include, right? A little mark at the top. And it's as though we don't matter because we are less than 1% or just at 1%. But it's an entire population that absolutely matters. And so for giving space today, I am just, again, I'm so appreciative because time and time again, Native people are not included in even issues of equity. <coughs> equity conversations at colleges, universities, you'll hear about every other population except for Native and Indigenous people. Um, so the issue of sterilization, right? The devaluing of Native women, that comes from an internalized idea that we need to systemically erase this people. The experience of me being in the foster care system, Indian Child Welfare Act, Right, that was put into place in the late 70s because the government was intentionally taking and removing Native children from their families and placing them with Caucasian families 
to assimilate them and erase their culture. It happened so much that Native communities from across the country band together and petitioned Congress to pass this law, mm -hmm. ICWA, Indian Child Welfare Act, and it was threatened by the state of Texas this year, mm -hmm. saying it's racist, mm -hmm. saying it's racist. It is still under threat because federal, federal judges don't know their history because they have not taken an ethnic studies class or heard the content that you're hearing tonight. The devaluing of Native people, Native kids, the ideology from the doctrinal discovery that we've learned about in the past and how it systemically shows up with a medical professional or a judge or just Joe Schmo who devalues a woman's body. Have you heard of the MMIW phenomenon? Missing and murdered indigenous women and girls? Um, the National Criminal Justice Training Center, uh, I have a few stats for you. Um, American Indian and Alaska Native women experience violence, four out of five will experience violence in their life. Four out of five Alaska Native or Indian women will experience violence in their life. 2.5, they will experience it 2.5 times more, violent more, excuse me, they will experience violent crimes 2 5 times more than any other racial group. They experience rape and sexual assault two times more than any other racial group. In 2016, according to the National Institute of Justice, 5,712 Native American women experienced sexual assault. Guess how much was actually, how many of those cases were logged into the Department of Justice? database. Just over 100. 116 to be exact. Did you know that if you are a non-Native person who commits a sexual assault to a Native woman on a reservation, there is a legal loophole and you will not be criminally charged? Because in federal Indian law, the doctrine of discovery still exists. The Cherokee Nation is um, having a fun legal battle with Walmart right now because of, of the Doctrine of Discovery and ideas that uh, legal loopholes. Um, so if you want to learn more, let me know. But there's a lot of challenges with um, things that happen on Indian land when people commit crimes with Native people. This is also related to this, but kind of is a, a little bit different, is mass incarceration. When we th see Native people, there's usually certain stereotypes that we think of them. I've heard, not intelligent, because I have a lot of other negative names for myself and my, my friends, family. I've heard things to do with um, substance abuse, those kind of challenges. Just reducing people to the label, and that's it also criminal, right? And so incarceration is definitely a thing, but there's a lot of literature in Native studies that talks about the over-policing of the poor and also the over-policing of people of color, but particularly the over-policing of Native American people. Did you know that according to the Bureau of Justice in 2019, 38% Native American people are incarcerated at 38% higher rates than the national average of any other group. In 19 states, they are overrepresented more than any other race in prison. Native people make up the less than 1% of the population, but currently make up 2.1% of the prison population. In my dissertation work, I cited that there were more people incarcerated in the state of Minnesota than there were not incarcerated <laughs> when it comes to Native men specifically. Does it mean that they're committing crimes? Maybe they are committing crimes, but there's this experience of over policing. My friend who got her, her 111 just before me and encouraged me to get mine and help me work through am I enough issues. She told me that she won't stop in certain towns because before she got her 111, which 
in certain regions, people know it's, it's an Indian, a native tattoo. She said, I could pass as maybe a Hawaiian woman, I could pass as a Latina, I could even pass as a, a really tan white woman. But once you have a 111, people know you're different. They know you're a native person, a native woman. She's like, I can't stop there. Those police, they want to get a feather in their cap, meaning they want to get a ticket, they want to ticket another native person. There are certain regions where we know not to not to even stop because it is so bad. It's hard to believe until you experience it, but I have so many friends who've been to prison, who are cousins and relatives, who went to prison over the tiniest little charges, and they didn't have money, so they couldn't get a lawyer. And then when they got to prison, they resisted arrest, or they resisted something, and they got time added. And then um, they grouped together um, to like come together as a group, uh, for some kind of racial politics that were happening, um, even just refusing to eat so they could get better um, treatment, and then they get more time added. And so all of a sudden, someone's in there for 15 years. I know so many Native brothers who've gotten out of prison and are clean and sober in a place where they can easily get access to anything. The amount of people I know in prison out of all the different groups I know, the most people I know are Native. And does it mean that they are just super criminals? I know a ton of white people who also had done crimes of poverty as well, right? It's unreal. So mass incarceration um, and the abolition movement, that's tricky and it usually divides people and makes people really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but I do have, there are some resources if you want to learn more or even just like be the devil's advocate on that. Um, it's not my main area of academic expertise, but I just am throwing it out there for you because it is a challenge. It is a challenge of the native community that they can't go into certain spaces because they perceive that they are targeted. They perceive that they are over policed and they are perceived that they are not safe. <laughs> Whether those things are reality, a lot of um, research suggests that that is indeed the case, but then there's also other sides that say, no, that's absolutely not the case, right? And so I'm not here to push one thing or another, but just to bring awareness to that. Another issue we were talking about are Yosemite relatives. The Southern Sierra Miwok Nation is the tribal nation that's associated up there in Mariposa and Yosemite. Do you know that they've been seeking federal recognition for over 40 years? I'm sure you have children who are similar age or maybe even older. They are being denied that they are an actual tribe. Mm -hmm. Think about if you have a health issue and your insurance company says, oh, we don't recognize that, like Lyme's disease, that's not a real thing. We won't cover that. But you have a cluster of symptoms and a certain experience, right? There's over 30 tribes right now in the state of California that are like, hey, we're a distinct group of people, and the government is saying, no, you're not. Give us an agenda at your last ceremony. I'm sorry, we don't do agendas in Sweat Lodge. <laughs> <laughs> we come together and do a roundhouse uh, ceremony. Um, did you did you keep records for that? You have minutes. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of challenges, right? Legal challenges. Financially, that tribe doesn't have an income. They cannot do gaming. They cannot have business ventures because they're officially not viewed as a, a legitimate tribe. They are a tribe, though, and they're just not recognized. They don't carry that privilege. And so the people who are part of that tribe, I carry the privilege of being an enrolled member of a federally recognized tribe. What would happen if those relatives <coughs> became recognized? Do you think the government would actually give up Yosemite? Would they get the land back? <laughs> I highly doubt it. <laughs> Could it possibly have something to do with the resources and the tourism industry? Mm -hmm. I don't know, right? But we, one, of the, one of the itemized reasons was because they didn't have data of one of their last ceremonies, like no detailed list of attendees of one of their bear dances or ceremonies that they, they had there. Um, so recognition effort, efforts and trying to maintain tribal sovereignty is really hard when you have to go through legal loopholes. And um, there's a lot of challenges with the government because they are technically um, have it in the constitution where they're like the legal parent to watch over the native tribes so they have a certain amount of control 
um, but also tribes are sovereign nations. We entered into a relationship and in our um, constitution, we are nation to nation with each other as two sovereigns. But are we treated that way all the time? It depends. <coughs> if our California governor were to come into a space, imagine the entourage that would happen for this politician. Chairmen and chairwomen of tribal nations are equivalent, or even more so. Do they have an entourage? Do they have, you know, the same type of rapport and respect? I don't know. You will see how if you ever see any interactions, but nation to nation in our constitution, it is written. <coughs> Excuse me, I have allergies. <laughs> So these are, um, it's, it, the challenges come at all levels. There's um, something called the Segorite Land Trust. Um, what's pretty amazing is that the city of Oakland is talking with the original inhabitants, the Ohlone people, um, Costa Noa and Ohlone people of the Bay Area. Imagine how pricey the Bay is, right? Just to even rent one bedroom or a studio there, like this much of space is probably <laughs> a lot. <laughs> The mayor of Oakland a few years ago said, you know what, I don't wanna be contributing or repeating the cycles of harm to native people. You know what we should do? We should give some land back. Because that's a thing, land back is a movement. If you have land that you have no use for, there's probably a tribe that could utilize some, a piece of your land. I'm just throwing that out there. But the city of Oakland said, you know what, let's do this. Let's talk to this tribe. Let's let them choose. Let's not give them our garbage, but let's let them choose what peace in our city limits they want. So this, this tribe, the Ohlone people, the Lisan Ohlone people came and we want something in the Oakland Hills. <laughs> Wouldn't you want something in the Oakland Hills? <laughs> okay, let's do it. But that tribe is not fairly recognized. So can you imagine the legal loopholes of trying to own a piece of property if you are not a legal entity? Because it can't go to you or me, we're just individuals, it has to go to our tribal nation. So they create, they work with a native scholar named Beth Rose Manning, and they created a land trust, and they named it the Segorte Land Trust. And so this it is in the care, it's for rematriating land, and it's a women, indigenous women, urban Indian led movement. And I was, uh, my husband is cousin, like first cousins with the woman who is the chair of that tribe. And we were invited at the land back party <laughs> when the city of Oakland said, here you go, here's a piece of land in the Oakland Hills. And they put it in this land trust for the Segorte uh, land trust and this tribe. History being made right there. And there's been other instances of it throughout the state of California. So much so that there's a land back symposium at Cal Poly Humboldt every year now mm -hmm. to talk about what land back is and if people don't want to reproduce harm and they, instead of giving pieces of land to random corporations or whatever, that how you can get land back to the original people. So that is a success that is happening because it takes, it's a responsibility of everyone to think, what can I do? Maybe what you can do is to just educate yourself or to be vulnerable in spaces like this, or to talk to your friend who won't come to a space like this, but knows you and would be open to what you say, <laughs> right? Or if you're like, you know, I got 20 acres I'm not using. <laughs> <laughs> or you know someone who's got 20 acres they're not using. Or if you know someone who's got property with material or resources that we use for gathering, or a bunch of abalone you're not using, we use those things for ceremony and we can't, we can't go die, we can't go gather them, right? So if you know people who have resources that any of our tribes need, that's how we work together, right? Um, so it's not about um, expecting you to give anything or to ever do that, but it's just planting seeds about what is it that you wanna do as a responsible guest or citizen on native land and living with native communities. In um, Native Studies classes that um, I teach at Stan State and at um, Columbia, I ask students to think about what does it mean to be on Native land? 
there's an app you can look up that says on native land. It shows you what native land you're on. It's a website too. What does it mean to be building relationship with the land that you're on? Or building relationship with the, the tribal peoples that live in this area? It doesn't mean you have to go to ceremonies or try to go get and be buddy buddy with them. But what does it mean to like live on land that was stolen? Like you guys didn't steal it. But maybe it means praying for your ancestors who did. Or maybe it means that you just try to be a responsible citizen. And that might look different for every single person. It could just be having an open heart and learning. And you don't know what to do with that knowledge. But I invite students to always ask, what does that mean for them? Because I don't have the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm on Miwok land. I'm married into that tribe, so I'm learning that language. Because in a traditional way, I would have to be learning that language. <laughs> and we, I probably would have known at least three other native languages, right? So I'm trying to be a responsible guest on Miwa clan to learn that. And you don't have to do anything at all, right? Um, but it is an invitation to just think about what does it mean to be living on this land? What is, how would you build a relationship? Or um, what does it mean for you? Or how could you educate yourself more? Because we covered just a tiny bit of topics that Native American Studies is a four-year discipline, a master's degree, a doctorate, and the 11 pages of books is not even the half of them. <laughs> there are some music videos and a couple of podcasts I put on there too. Um, there's poetry and literature, um, but really they're just, um, if you want to learn more, about any kind of area, whether it's history, politics, art. Um, I just wanted to give you resources because this is really, again, just one small perspective. It's, it's just my very small worldview and then a small tidbit about some of these things that are currently happening and that are experienced by so many of our Native people. Um, we have about a half hour left and so um, I want to be mindful of any questions that you might have or any conversation that you want to have together. So I will kind of stop throwing out stuff in a stream of consciousness for you <laughs> um, and just be open to um, any questions that you have. So I have one question. Yeah. Well, I have a few actually. <laughs> um, and it's kind of personal. Yeah, in yeah, your household, right. when you were with your grandparents who did not acknowledge your tribe and all that. Yeah. Did, was there any Christianity? Did I miss that? Or did, oh, there... so I didn't actually say that. But yeah. Yes, there, okay. there was definitely a lot of Christianity. I was uh, reading the Bible every night, and um, my grandma was very strict and very literal interpretation of the Bible. And my grandpa was um, a baptized um, Mormon LDS when he grew up in southern Idaho, like with very traditional views of that perspective. And then um, my mom, who I would see go in her home and then come back, she was like, tarot card reading, crystal reading kind of person, you know? Um, and, um, so, so I had a mix. <laughs> I had a mix of influences. Um, and I went to the LDS church a lot and I asked a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. And then I realized I probably wasn't welcome there. <laughs> um, but I, I did go and I had, I had a lot of experiences where I had some really positive experiences. Um, but then as I started questioning like gender roles, and just a lot of things um, that I was forced. I was like really forced to go. And the, we were really poor and we didn't have like nice clothes and the scriptures I had were really tattered. And so, um, and we had to get rides with people who were going because my grandma and grandpa wouldn't go. So, and they, but they were forcing us to go, right, with other people. And so my brother and I were teased and made fun of for not having a family to sit with mm -hmm. and looking different, being different, being from the reservation. Um, having like tattered scriptures and definitely like not clean clothes. So it was really a lot of things, right? Like classism, um, just people who didn't make us feel welcome, which I know isn't the heart of what Christianity actually is about. Um, like I know that for sure, but it was just in a, a certain area and region is what our experiences were. I have another question. Yeah. Yeah. When you said um, there's a loophole with crimes against Native women in, in on Native land. Is that for Native people or just anybody passing through your land? So, so Native people are held accountable 
to any crime that they are committing on native land. But non-native people are not held to those legal standards. So if you've ever seen the movie Wind River, yeah. have anyone, has anyone seen that? Um, it is a movie that talks about in um, the oil fields. There, there's actually um, like a severe amount of targeting native women for sexual assault. I mean, people will also just have relationships, right? But then there's also targeted trafficking and sexual assault because they know they can get away with it as non-native people committing crimes on native land. That's the legal loophole. Sorry. <coughs> Good question. Any other questions? Um, Reverend Ian Rodriguez? Hey, I was just wondering, to sidetrack this before, but what would you do? Where would you start to make the educational system welcoming and receptive to native people? You know, um, there's a few schools that have really fantastic models, and um, one is at a community college. Um, it is in, um, oh gosh, I can't think of the name of the town. Um, so, but the model of what they have is when you actually have for one, like not just a student center, like that's a tiny closet, but like a space, like literature shows that you need a space for native students, mm -hmm. you need native faculty representation, mm -hmm. and you need a climate where native voices are welcome, valued, and heard, and actually wanted. And so that has to be at all levels. So um, in, my, in my, my scholarly research myself, I had native, 10 native faculty who all had doctorates and they shared their experiences of being women, native women, who are operating in academia, right? So obviously they got through as students and what's it like to even just be there to help hold the space for native students to come through and any other student? And one of those things that happens is when you see abuse happening to your teachers, it doesn't make you feel safe as a student, mm -hmm. right? And so you need to first examine that as, at the same time as creating spaces for our Native students to even have a space for themselves. Um, so for one example is um, one, one faculty member told me that in issues of, like say we're having a meeting, say this is like a, any kind of work meeting, and we're all in here, a native person is going to be like they felt the responsibility to be the only person who's ever raising their hand to say hey we're talking about racism here or hey we're talking about settler colonialism here mm -hmm. settler colonialism is actually that continued erasure of native people like we're not a part of the conversation because we're less than one percent of the population or our narratives and stories don't exist well but we're still here and what that experience is um so like say the weed industry, right? Marijuana, people are like, hey, it's legal now. Like, let's take the gummy to help us sleep at night mm -hmm. or like whatever, right? <laughs> but there's actually a book written that's called um, Settler Cannabis from Green Rush to Gold Rush. Mm -hmm. Because what ha is happening is there's further exploitation of the land for the profits of growing mm -hmm. marijuana. And then what's happening to those pockets where we can gather material for this yeah. or hold our ceremonies or the continuing of like pillaging the land like strip mining would do it. And so if a college is talking about having a cannabis studies major, but they're like, oh, we're gonna actually support the white kids to go through this. But if there's a black man trying to go through this, like, huh, what's the different perceptions of that, right? Or like these other conversations um, of like, Columbia College has um, the claim junkies as the mascot, which if you don't know what that is, it's like stealing someone's gold mine, right? But also, they're the same people. They're like the epitome of the gold rush. So for a native person, I have a really strong reaction to that. But we had um, some faculty on campus say, that's not racist. In fact, the local tribe has donated money to us, so we are really not racist for having this mascot, and they must not think we are either. And so the pressure on the faculty is to always say, this is a conversation about colonialism. This is about settler colonialism. This is about racism. The pressure always falls to that faculty member. They have minimal support and their voices are not wanted or heard. If I'm at Columbia and I'm the only person saying, this mascot is a little bit challenging, nobody wants to hear that because it's let's celebrate the gold rush. So much so we want this mascot. Mm -hmm. And so in an environment that is a, the kind of hostile environment in a way, right? It's really hard to operate in that environment. So the first thing to change would be like, 
are we really, as humans, creating space for all of our neighbors? Are we valuing every person's voice? Or are we just like steamrolling with our ideology, our views all the time only? Or actually, are we checking our blind spots? Like, what is my bias? Do I have one? What could it possibly be? Or what may I not know enough about to talk about? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that really has to happen in education for it to be welcoming for not just Native students, but every student population. Right. So you think like there should be a, some sort of like a, um, a course in high school, like we have courses, Native American course that we should all take, right? So it's funny you bring it up, right? So we were talking about this earlier. What the content we're covering is ethnic studies, Native American studies, 100% uh plus like personal content from me right <laughs> over sharing the california um state university now requires every single student to take at least one ethnic studies class which is this untold perspective from an african-american native american asian american or mexican mexican american perspective California community colleges definitely jump on that bandwagon because they prepare students for transfer. The UCs are slowly coming onto that, but they haven't made it official yet. And in the K through 12 system, there is a movement happening, but it's really slow. Um, so right now there's um, K through 12 model curriculum that could be used, but it's up to teachers to use it. So tribal nations are working in with their county office of education to create local tribal histories, but it's up to the local area to create that and implement it. Do you think there should be more, I mean, obviously more Native American teachers? 100%. Yeah, like, but yeah, I think visibility going, going is... Going to school, going to education, becoming teachers, well, becoming teachers. We have, stu we have tons of Native kids going through college and going through these systems, but many reasons they're not persisting. And then they are, but not all are going through education. They're going into sciences, they're going into other areas. And so, but they, with those who are in education, it's the same thing, it's like you're being cold shouldered out, right? And so um, how long can you be in a hostile work environment before you decide to say, I'm out of here, I'm gonna do something else. Yeah. Okay, really quick, oh, I'm sorry, can you go ahead? No. I know. There are a couple other people that asked me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think David had a question too. Well, I was, I was going to ask about um, about museums because that's my background. Yeah. Um, and we were pretty sensitive. A, before I started, we had already repatriated any grave goods and, and human remains, but uh, which I 100% support. But even in doing um, exhibits, like we wouldn't, we didn't put um, like a lot of items because they may be sensitive spiritually and, and so on. And we tried to be real sensitive about that. But um, what, what's your, what are your comments about museums? Um, so, you know, I think that museums, when I go to a place like that doesn't have native representation and they're talking about the gold rush, I get pissed. Mm -hmm. And everyone in my family is offended and like, how can yeah. they have this and not have any representation? And we are just like, forget this place, right? And we don't even want to be there. But museums that are for native people and native displays, um, when there's that sensitivity and that mindfulness, I, I think they're really important because they help, it's a way of educating people because even the most, like if you think about college, the more you go to school, the more narrow your focus is. Mm -hmm. That's how we get judges and MDs who could do really unreal and unbelievable things, right? You, you give such power and authority to the people in charge. And so like even all of us, right? The only way we're gonna get exposed is in these public spaces and the spaces like tonight. And so museums are a fantastic way to teach your family, to have exposure and learn. So I think they're vital. But I think if you have it done in partnership with a tribal nation or if they're invited at a reception and maybe they can share song and culture or stories, then that makes it even more powerful. Um, we did that some, but I, I have to point out the, the epitome of that, which I worked my whole career towards and never achieved. It's Sacramento History Museum recently opened an exhibit and it's, I'll say, guest curated by the Shingle Springs uh, band of Miwok Indians, okay. and um, 
they did the exhibit. And I mean, in partnerships, but they were the lead partner. And that's the way it should be. And I went to the opening ceremony for that with song and, and uh, native representation uh, last Saturday, I think it was. Wow. Wow. So, uh, but that's where, that's the epitome. Like I said, I never got that. <laughs> yeah. I never got that that pulled off. But but your efforts were there, yeah. right? <laughs> and you and you laid a foundation. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Andrea, do you have a question for one of you? I'm a retired school teacher, and I'm sitting here going, "Oh my heart." <laughs> um, I think. <clears throat> training for teachers in this would be so valuable. I'm thinking about all, Janie, all our cute little <laughs> pilgrim Indian things at Thanksgiving. And it was always, the, and then I, I had third grade and that was local. And then fourth grade was state. And then I even had fifth grade and that was the whole country covering um, Native American tribes. And, and there was, it was interesting in so far, but it, it, it fell so short of the kind of sensitivity that you're talking about. It was like, oh, that was for Larry, not for Larry. You know. um, so I, 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 I'm just thinking in terms of a, a change that could happen. <coughs> teachers get sent to workshops and mm -hmm. trainings <laughs> constantly. Yeah. Why yeah. not this one? Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I agree with you. And um, one of the women who was on the chair of my dissertation committee. She is an ethnic studies teacher in Yuma County and does things at the education level in her uh, the county level. And they have an ethnic studies um, kind of like academy in the summer that they invite for community members and teachers and any educator to go through and learn different perspectives. So there's um, there was two teachers at my daughter's school in Tuolumne who wanted to go, who were like, hey, I want to learn more. Um, so they decided to go to that, but. In general, there's not a whole lot unless you seek someone out who would do workshops, um, or you know there there is in, in teaching teacher programs now there's something called cultural responsive pedagogy, um, and that um, is rooted in ethnic studies um, pedagogy and they talk about examining whiteness as a whole and like what does that mean because we are we root things in that like. Indian pilgrim narrative, and we don't look at any other thing besides that. Um, and so, and then also, like, what does it mean with our own biases interacting with students of different backgrounds? And so, they get really complicated and layer in. Um, I have a few different like scholarly articles about it, but there's like designated funding for community colleges to have like, let's implement this approach on our campus and. Um, I, I always like jokes, and I, I said a joke that in email that I thought was funny. Um, <laughs> was like, if we're not talking about race, like why would we talk about examining whiteness? Like, <laughs> no one's gonna want to do that, <laughs> you know? Because that's hard. Like having this conversation, right, is hard. Even just like right now, like we've had really great things to talk about. Me being vulnerable, you guys being kind, listening to me, like feeling a little socially awkward, but. But then still, like, those things are rooted in it, right? Because I had a friend last year say, well, my friends and I dress up every Thanksgiving. We dress up as pilgrims and Indians, and I, I don't want to be a pilgrim. I want to be an Indian. What's wrong with that? She said that to me. And she's like, you need to tell me why that's wrong, Stephanie. Because she learned in her grade school that it was okay to do. Right? It was such an early memory for her that she had fun. It was like a wholesome activity. And so as an adult, they're like drinking, watching football, and dressing up at the party as a theme. Mm -hmm. And then telling me I need to educate her. And so I was like, <laughs> like, what am I supposed to say to this? Right? Yeah. And so I do agree with you 100%. And we, but to have those conversations, I think it requires the level of openness that you all have right now. Even if you're a little uncomfortable or you're totally comfortable, like we have to have that level. People have to be wanting to have those. They can't be forced, otherwise they're gonna be like, I'm out. Or I'm on my phone. See you later. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, Stephanie, when we were talking about grade school, you know, it's like my kids are now 29, 28, and 31, 30. 
And so I came from Ohio. And so coming through grade school here for these little kids, it's like, oh, well, I knew what oil I learned back in my time about the Hopewell, you know, in Ohio and the Indian mounds and things like that that are very precious. Well, here it's you learn in third grade or fourth grade the missions. Yeah. 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 You know, and there's very little, and of course, coming from the Roman Catholic background, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm going to help you build your mission. Yeah. You know? yeah. But I struggle yeah. so much with all of that right now, you know? And I, I have I have plates in my I have, I'm taking the things off my wall because it's like no yeah. that's not right anymore that's not right. right but that's when I think about school that's what children are being taught is about the missions not and very little about the genocide that happens and you know the ep, the uh, you know the epidemic and the and the death that occurred yeah. and the slavery that occurred yeah. but the missions are what's taught because we have the real, you know, the real, you know, El Camino from bottom to top, you know, and um, so well, you do it's, know a lot. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I do. They know those missionaries. Well, because, I, because you know, we we did it. She and has kids. Just, she likes to know those things. But the thing is, is that there's not that perspective. Yeah. And and I'm not blame teachers. My goodness, right. my kids have been out yeah. in Rockland School District now for a long, long time. Yeah. But to have that discussion now in that area, yeah. oh my God, I would never, I, you know, I probably had a gun put it, pointed at me, you know, yeah. because that's how critical the conversation feels in yeah. certain spaces, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and it's not, it, and it's just, um, and I feel for teachers because they really want to do what's good and what's yes. right. Yes. So. I have a question on that because yeah. I did teach all of us and I did have a Thanksgiving program every year and I have vests and all of yeah. it. And um, so for little kids, like say kindergarten and like that, what would you want to be telling them? I mean, I felt like we were sharing there was friendship and, you know, good and there, right. you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm torn from thinking but, I did something horrible because I don't no. think I did. I had some indigenous, indigenous things that um, children in my class that actually would come and dance part of the program and everything. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, but I mean, obviously, um, maybe that. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I still think it, there is something that we maybe maybe that's just embedded in me, but um, I don't know. Well, and I think for one, it's. It's hard to, when you're feeling those feelings of shame, like I taught something that is like not historically completely accurate, mm -hmm. right? Or there's mm -hmm. other pieces to the story. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that it's gonna serve you to go down a shame spiral for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but it, but it's, because you can't go back, right? No, um, I don't feel shame. I feel right. it was true. I mean, the parents loved it and they were right. all there. Right. So, right. so right. I mean, I don't know, but you know, maybe right. I should feel ashamed. Right. But I know it was, right. you know. Right. So, um, but, but I mean, what sh what would it have been a better? I don't know. So, so there's a lot of debate about what's appropriate mm -hmm. to teach because Native families teach kids the truth. Mm -hmm from a young age, they don't go into graphic detail where they're like, yeah, no, this happened, and then they yeah. killed everybody, mm -hmm. right? My daughter has known from a really young age, um, and all, I knew from a young age, like every, but it's like age-appropriate exposure. Right, right. right. Um, but anyone who's non-Native says that's not age-appropriate. Mm -hmm. And and that, mm -hmm. so there's actually a lot of articles that are written about this, and there's a lot of literature. There's <coughs> something I show my students, um, it's like a, specifically about this as teachers and comments that go back and forth. And so I don't have an easy answer for you about what should be said instead, mm -hmm. because I think you're right, like in certain spaces, you're gonna have a gun pulled upon you. Mm -hmm. And I think in other spaces, you're gonna have like, no, like like this is why we have such, we have a tie, we have emotional investment in narratives. Like mm -hmm. complete emotional investment. We have the scene in our head, we have the nostalgia, we have smells that come mm -hmm. up. We have it imprinted, and we don't want to disrupt that. It is embedded in so many ways, and and it's its own indoctrination of what this celebration means. 
And that in itself is so hard to undo and reimagine. And any suggestion is gonna feel uncomfortable and foreign. And so when you start reading like alternatives or age appropriate explanations for Thanksgiving at each level, because there are suggestions, mm -hmm. there are suggestions um, that you could look up for um, ethnic studies model curriculum is the language of the state right now. Um, you, you are gonna probably resist it or you might be open to it. Um, but every family member, you would have to do it right now. It would suck to be a teacher in the case <laughs> of students, right? Because, because you're going to have every person who has that same narrative who is going to reject it. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have the Native families who are like, what do you mean you're not telling the truth? <laughs> right? And then you're going to have other people who are like, how can you exclude this? Right? Or are you trying to push this on my kid? Right. And then they're going to tell you why critical race theory is outlawed in several states across the country mm -hmm. and how this is related to that. And so it's so uneasy. It's so complicated. And there's no easy answer. <laughs> and I wish I had a very explicit one for you. But that discomfort and that, like, exactly, I think that's like the perfect example of, of everything that we are taught, right? Like, specific narratives of any type is it's exactly like that it's a great parallel yeah sorry. just a comment kind of a side comment i was helping a neighbor kid with their social studies class which was world history at that point sixth grade if i'm remembering correctly and all of china was reduced to three pages <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and of those three pages, a page and a half was about the clothing that was worn in a particular century. Mm -hmm. And that was Chinese history. Mm -hmm. And it really brought home to me how voluminous mm -hmm. the world is and how to try to reduce it to manageable age appropriate challenges is so time. difficult. Yeah. You know, what you're saying, how do you choose? How do you know what is age appropriate for this group in this place at this time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and what do you leave out? Well, and that's changed too, right? Because in the 90s, we were about multiculturalism. As long as we have representation from every group, we're good. Let's bring all the food one, from every group possible. <laughs> <laughs> we have done our job. Yes. <laughs> and, and then we've moved to like, let's have more social justice orient oriented stuff, right? We need their histories and their voices. Do you know how many students challenge me that I'm biased and that the material I'm sharing is actually not accurate? Mm -hmm. Do you know that every woman I interview for my dissertation work has had threats against them, has had complete outlandish remarks about defending the Bering Strait theory and all these other things. Do you think a biology instructor would have those <laughs> remarks or would have a, a, a parent come into the classroom teaching biology? But when you're talking about this content, parents and students are gonna have such different reactions because it's no longer representation right social justice has become a trigger word it's misused and what it really means is not it is is trying to have what you're talking about and what you're talking about what we're all here for in the first place but it gets exploited and manipulated and so i think that is why it's it is even more challenging because we want to do more than just have the food at the table we want to hear those stories and those perspectives but because of this like marriage to these narratives and it's so embedded in us, mm -hmm. it's really hard to see past that. Mm -hmm. Especially if we have ever had individual benefit from the things, right? Then it makes it even more complicated and we're like, I'm shut down, I'm leaving, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, and then intersectionality, right? For me as being a mixed um, person, right? Like I don't have the same experiences as my husband. He's super dark. He's been incarcerated. Um, he went to a different college, right? <laughs> we joke about that. But we had the same, we were in foster care, we had the same upbringing, and um, we had very different experiences. In school, I was quiet, he was quiet. He was, he was um, punitive, penalized. I just couldn't see, and I was traumatized, right? And so I just looked like I was listening. <laughs> but as a young native boy who's dark, people thought he just was disinterested, mm -hmm. right?
like the individual bias in the room. Mm -hmm. And so then like you would get sent to the principal's office, I would just still like get by, <laughs> right? And so there's other things that could happen with individual interactions, mm -hmm. whether it's in the classroom or like outside of spaces. And but then like I, I had such amazing teachers who helped me get through school. Like I wouldn't mm -hmm. be where I am without the support that I got. Um, and so so I just feel like it's it's very complicated and there's no easy answer, but we're all like collectively taking steps, right? We're being open, we're being vulnerable, and then our brains are hurting because we're like thinking in new ways. And that's why some people also just, they shut down or they're like, no, I really wanna keep thinking about this. And so that's also why I brought you so many books. <laughs> For fun reading is the fiction. And, um, <laughs> And then the scholarly, there's scholarly stuff in there too. <laughs> yeah. Did you hear about the Seminoles being able to sit at the table with the congressman because when they wrote the um, Declaration of Independence, some of them included the Seminoles in there? I did not, but that's pretty cool. It was on the news maybe like a month and a half ago, and I reported it. Oh but God. there's not very many people that heard it that day. Okay. So like, I'm Native American. I'm from Oklahoma. So I, I have friends that are Seminoles and stuff like that. So I haven't had a chance to reach them yet, but I wanted to ask them, you know, what is, what is that about? How did that come to be? And how come it took them so long? Because I guess the Congress people didn't want to acknowledge it, but someone read it all the way through and they found that in there, so. Mm -hmm. wow. no. Well, I know there's a lot of things that are written and we don't know because if we don't like advocate for ourselves, like even holding that piece that like, uh, we are nation to nation and that's in the Constitution and if you know we can demand certain rights but if we don't hold people accountable then it's not going to happen yeah. and so so what you're what you're describing sounds like someone holding people at the highest level accountable yeah. <laughs> but yeah I just wanted to be heard about that so thank you for sharing I didn't have to look it up <laughs> <laughs> I, actually I think I had heard I had either heard or read something and it was we always uh, we always espouse that the you know the founding fathers were so much dependent on looking at France and the um, uh, you know the beginnings of their constitution and everything but in reality new new readers and new information is coming to life that no it wasn't necessary it was it was bringing in some of the already established Native American you know, uh, 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 community and uh, governance that were already established within uh, the the areas where people were settling that was then kind of added in, you know, or used as some foundation. So I'm from, I don't remember exactly where it was, but I also okay. remember your yeah, comment here. Yeah, I saw here. the news and it was like it was just like a quick thirty seconds. And I'm like. <laughs> At least it got your time. <laughs> well, and, and you, yeah. 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 I, I have it on my yeah. phone. So. <laughs> yeah, and I, I feel like that's the other thing, right? Is there's not a lot of visibility about these things, um, like the MMIW movement, right? Like missing and murder is a real issue. Um, like my aunt, my dad's sister, um, she was an elder when she was murdered a few years ago, just like three years ago. She was in her 60s, early 60s, still really young, and they still don't know who did this. Mm -hmm. And so, but you don't hear it on the news, um, this like extreme epidemic is happening where these women are being targeted. And so, um, You'll see now that you've heard that MMIW, you also see missing and murdered Indigenous people because it does help for men as well, two spirit relatives. Um, so you'll see it now that you've heard it, um, but now you'll know what it means, right? And so I think structurally, you know, you don't hear about Native people or these issues because it's again, it's a systemic tool to like that invisibility. It, it doesn't benefit Native people. Um, so yeah. I'm sorry to be so ignorant about this, but um, when you were talking about the sovereignty of reservations, that they're their own country, um, do, do outsiders, for example, I, would we need permission to come on to? I mean, is there, do we need permission? That's a great question. So, so, 
So um, someone who's not from there, so it, it's a, it's treated as a nation to nation stat status. Mm -hmm. And so it's not technically a foreign country. Um, it is a land you can go through. Mm -hmm. um, there's roads that go through, especially like if you're going through Arizona, a lot of people have to drive through reservations all the time. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes you'll see you'll just see a sign like now entering this reservation or this rancheria. Um, so usually um, some tribes are very welcoming and have major tourism industry. So like in Cherokee, North Carolina, they profit heavily. It's near Ohio, right? That mm -hmm. region sort of. Um, they profit heavily off of tourists. Mm -hmm. So they're like, come on down, we'll show you. Um, all kinds of stuff they may make their cultural piece a, a, a way of making money um, but then there's other tribes that are maybe not super friendly to outsiders mm -hmm. because of all the damage that's happened to their community mm -hmm. so you may not feel super welcome on certain communities because they're like oh I don't know you who are you mm -hmm. or because when there's outsiders you have extreme amounts of trafficking or um, like exploiting or whatever that happens and so it doesn't mean that it's like a personal thing. It's just an automatic defense mechanism mm -hmm. if you don't necessarily feel welcome. Um, or you might be like, welcome, then come on in, you know? And so it just depends on the location, the tribe itself, if you're traveling with people who are from that area, um, or you're just passing through. So, um, you know, it's not like you have to be fearful for your bodily harm or anything like that. You just like, you might have people staring at you, wondering who you are. <laughs> um, and so you're, and then other people are like, oh yeah, you know, like they, you completely welcome. And so it's, you don't need permission per se, okay. unless it's like a closed res, and they usually would have signs like saying like that. Okay. But it, I don't know many of those. And, and sorry, one more question. So we're, so is it like if, if a person is a member of a certain is it called like a registered tribe? Is that what you would say? Um, a federally recognized. A federally recognized mm -hmm. tribe. Yeah. And then, um, so everybody who's part of that same federally recognized tribe have a kinship with each other? Um, right? Yeah. Well, I, and what I'm really, I'm getting to is, so I'm thinking about, um, sorry, this is just like a silly question, but do you have like a dual citizenship? Are you an American citizen and a citizen of your tribe? That's a fantastic question. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it actually, so we are, a, we, we don't call it dual citizenship, mm -hmm. but that's actually what it is, it's a <clears throat> political identity. So if you're an enrolled member, you have your tribal nation, mm -hmm. and some, some tribes are like, no, you need to remember we are a nation, so you might hear a name like Yocha Dihi Wintan Nation, you know, the um, Cash Creek Casino, mm -hmm. They, that's the name of that tribal nation. Mm -hmm. um, some tribes might just say, oh, we are the Tuami Lula Rancheria tribe or the Indian group of this, right? They might use the word Indian in their name, even though a lot of tribes don't use that language, but in federal law, it's still there. So some tribes just insist on using that. Um, politically, there's variations of what you, how people want to be called. Um, and so, yeah, so you, you have your you have, you're a U.S. citizen. You have a U.S. passport if you want to get one, and you also have your tribal membership, which is a political identity. Mm -hmm. And so you are um, with your own group, and so it is like being a dual citizen. Um, I have mine actually. Yeah, yeah. 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 with a CAB card. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. it's just your name, and it gives you different blood. Oh, like wow. my tribe, you cannot. You have to be a sack and box certain quantity. I think the lowest you can be is three sixteenth sack and box. Anything less than that, mm -hmm. you can't be part of that tribe. Oh. Like my kids are, but my grandkids are not because they don't make that blood quantum yeah. unless they married another sack and box. Yeah. But then my kids did. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, and that kinship that you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know that you share this um, identity, which is cultural. Um, it could be racial, but it's usually more political. Mm -hmm. You'll have a wide range of how Native people look. Like you have, you know, a whole bunch of phenotypes of like super dark skin, super mm -hmm. light skin. We have Hoopa people who are like have blonde hair and blue eyes. So you got a whole mix. Um, and then you have some people, you know, you have distinct families within that tribe. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have some people who are a part of multiple tribes, but they are enrolled in just one. Um, or they might be involved in more than one. Um, different tribes have different rules about that. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. So you can vote. 
Yes, we can vote, but we didn't get that until a certain year, like way late. Like 1925? Yeah. Or something. yeah. 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 1923, because yeah. my mom was born in 1921. Yeah. <laughs> she was a citizen in 1923. And we didn't have the right to our freedom of religion until 1917. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I kind of have two questions. One is, what is your feeling about representation? Like, um, probably the biggest thing that right now is in entertainment is like Yellowstone. Oh, okay. So, how do you feel? Uh, what is your, do you have any thoughts about how uh, Native American people are represented in entertainment? Mm. And, like, right now, Yellowstone is like one of the biggest places, and I mean, it's very centered on this relationship or this community of yeah. Native American people and you know, yeah. land grab people and right. everything like that. It's a great question. Um, well, first off, because of, uh, you're talking about entertainment, I think you should all check out Reservation Dogs. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's on Hulu, um, so if you haven't seen it yet, okay. it, it's written by Native people, it's Native actors, it um, is in Oklahoma, it's like staged in Oklahoma, and it's it shows a mix of comedy, tragedy, all of the things, um, and a lot of native humor. So, Is that the word? Dog? Uh, dogs. 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 So, reservation dogs. 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 Oh, oh, dogs. Yeah, like. Um, That's great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like the canines. Mm -hmm. um, and because that gives like fantastic representations and from the native perspectives. Um, in general, I feel like. There's actually um, on your the, the last page of your or page handout. There's um, an actual a, a movie called Real Engine, R E E L Engine, that talks about this in detail about the complexities of the entertainment industry and how natives are portrayed. And so um, I think it's getting better in general, um, but it is, it is challenging because like Yellowstone plays off of some stereotypes, right? But there's still representation and it shows the different relationships and dynamics. And so um, it, it is very challenging. <laughs> um, I, I'm challenged anytime there's just basic stereotypes. Um, there are other movies and shows that I think do a better job of showing that. Um, one is... Um, um, how about Dark Winds? Yes, uh, oh, yeah. Dark Winds. Because yes. I've read all the Hill of the Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't until I worked at Chaco Canyon and with Navajo people. Oh, and yeah. then all of a sudden the, the books just came alive to me but and I understood them. But I think it's pretty well done. Yeah, Dark Winds is an amazing one. And that's yeah. on Amazon, yeah. um, Prime, yeah. uh, another one. There's. Um, there's another show, it's on Netflix right now. It's an older one, I can't, I can't even recall the name of it, but it's like, it's kind of like Yellowstone, but it's um, like, a, oh. it's a, got a cop who's like a cowboy. Right. Yeah, yeah. Longmire? Yes, Longmire. Longmire. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it shows more um, in further seasons about like all the dynamics about like MMIW and violence and the complexities. Yeah. So I think that is a better representation of like native people than just like the surface level that you get in, long, in a yellow circle. But And I just say one of the things that I see this kind of sea change is the fact that you have now movies and TV shows that are produced and directed and starring Native people. Yeah. And that didn't happen until very recently. Yeah. And, and that's also happening with his Native historians and archaeologists. Uh, we have California Natives who are writing incredible books on history and archaeology, anthropology here now and um, really blowing away a lot of the, the prior literature. <laughs> yeah, and, and that is what I think is one of the amazing successes is that it's pushing things from like our perspectives, these these voices that have never been included or at the table, they're, they're carving these ways. Um, there's two artists, like music, musician artists, they're like hip hop, I put them I was thinking of like young people in general who really like those, um, and I don't know if any of you like hip hop, but Frank Juan, the first one, and I put a music video on there that's called What Makes the Red Man Red, and even if you're not a fan of hip hop, 
Have you ever watched the, the TV show, the movie Peter Pan? Mm -hmm. It will show, it mixes images of Peter Pan oh. and this young man's mix of his, his, um, his uh, hip hop mm -hmm. and the, the lyrics that he has and how he overlays the graphics of the cartoon Peter Pan in this music video is very compelling. Mm -hmm. And so I invite you to check that music video out. Um, and then the other one is HGS Savage Fam, and I have a story about this. So this is definitely more like hip hop rap. Um, one of the main guys is um, lives in my area um, at the college that I work at and trying to create programming for Native students. Um, you know, the college didn't have ethnic studies or Native studies. It had one anthropology class that had not been taught for 10 years, a Native people of North America. When I got hired, I was like, man, we need to do something for Native people. This is crazy. And so um, we created something called Native Voices. And so it was a lecture series in the evening and inviting people to come. And I had a cultural speaker, an academic person share. And we had like 100 people come. And we had a couple of these different events. And then I, they said, hey, will you do this again? I said, well, I really want to like, do something for the youth. They're like, well, do whatever you want. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I know one of the women I interviewed for my dissertation, her research is on hip hop, native hip hop, and how it's used for cultural and language revitalization. Mm -hmm. So I was like, let's bring her and do an academic lecture and then have hip hop artists come and perform. And then we can have new like dancers and fry bread and all kinds of good food, right? And vendors. So I, I ended up having to raise like 20 grand real fast. <laughs> um, so uh, that, that worked somehow, but we got these performers to come. And unfortunately, we had people at the college say, are we sure that we want this element? <laughs> I had someone who worked in the security law enforcement world say, Stephanie, I don't care how you spin it. Hip hop is not just stories. It's going to bring, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z kind of people here. If you want this event to happen, you're going to have to pay for law enforcement off duty and a whole bunch of security officers. Because mm -hmm. I watched that one guy's video and they're not patriotic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, when he gets to that, I need a set list. Because if he's going to play that one song, we need to be ready to go. Oh, oh my gosh. And then they said, you might have counter protests, so we need to make sure we have a presence. There were no counter protests. It was a family friendly event. The meanest, hardcore looking guys, they wear bandanas around their face and they thought it was a gang affiliation. Mm -hmm. The guys wear the bandanas, it's a sacred practice, and they wanted to cover their face because that's not about them, it's about mm -hmm. their message. Right. And one of the lyrics that they said referenced the number of bullets that were sh that were um, fired. The law enforcement guys listening to the lyrics took that as a threat. Mm -hmm. The guys were speaking of history that happened at a certain massacre. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't matter the education that I was trying to provide. They had certain perceptions, mm -hmm. right? So it was great when these guys with the bandanas and looking all hardcore with lots of tattoos and they look really mean. I don't look mean. I'm super nerdy. <laughs> but they're they're doing their stuff looking like, you know, tough guys and they're getting all the little kids to come on stage and dance with them. Right? And be a part of this beautiful concert, outdoor event, lecture series, you know, with the music performers. And um, so I loved it because it was like, this is who Native people are, but we have the stereotype that they're mean, angry men. And they do have, and I had to say, well, of course they're gonna be angry. And what what emotion is it appropriate for men to sh display in public? Anger. <laughs> so yes, it's gonna sound angry in a certain kind of way. So HGS Savage Fam, the last name on that music video, they will look mean and intimidating, <laughs> but if you listen to their words, their word, their messages go into the prison to try to give those guys inside hope, and they just keep sharing their messages to talk about the history that's not shared unless you're in a Native Studies class, or about these kind of things that we're talking about. So if you want to get yourself even more uncomfortable, listen to one of these guys. <laughs> and you might like it. Um, <laughs> Um, all right, so 
we are 20 minutes past nine. Oh. I really appreciate all of this so much. So much. Thank you. Thank you. which is I hope you travel in a good way. Sadia Tani Kamu, thank you. Sadia is thank you in Hupa. Tani Kamu is thank you in Central Sierra Miwa. And then thank you. 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 Thank you, Stephanie. You have blessed us tonight. Yes. Thank you all for coming. Yes. Thank you. And uh, we'll be doing future events and look for it on Facebook. We'll let you know. Thank you for teaching. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, yes. My ex partner was a music teacher in Rockland School District for 20 some years. So, David, and I so want to get a picture of the three of us. Oh, okay. Sure. Hey, you. Yes, yes. So, if you could, yeah, that would be great. I'm so glad my children are now uh, out of that school district. Yeah, uh, I uh, Right now, they just had a big, uh, they just had a news thing about transgender, and then they're, they're starting to really ban books. I mean, it's just really horrible. It's really bad. Do you know? I saw it. I mean, just because. Oh, it's just classic county. It's so I'm so glad I don't live there anymore. I'm so glad the children graduated when it was like, did any of these people? Right. I love them. 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 My both my children were in a home. Oh, yes. That's good. Emma was the editor of Whitney. Oh, wow. She brought her children. She's a surgeon up in his But the point is that they, that, you know, and she she and her girlfriend were the first couple to go to prom. Now, I'm not sure I would want them to. Because I would say, you say, Todd Parker. Primary colors, real bright. Like the I like his book. Oh, I love those. Yes, yes. This is the only book that he does. It's Districts, like, yeah, no, I know. It talks about adoption. You know, when you mentioned something, it talks about adoption. I just feel some families have it. And I said, I'm not going to get it. 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 I'm not going